Hello, this is Lisa from Tournament Communications. Congratulations, Josiah and Caleb. Um, I want you to know visible in the box. She is So, Mrs. Schumacher, uh, should we begin with introductions like any other normal round, or is there anything that we are waiting for other than that? I believe that the protocol is that you can talk to the, you can ask the judges about their judging philosophies, but they have already been introduced. So, if you would like to do that, you may go ahead with that. or been experiencing technical difficulties. Uh, Caleb, were you there when the judges were introduced? I don't believe we had judge introductions, to my knowledge. I didn't hear it e either. Uh, Mrs. Schumacher, should we wait for tournament staff to do that, or should we ask for judging philosophy now? I believe they've been introduced in a separate room. So you can go ahead and, and the judges can introduce themselves as they see fit, and we'll go ahead and proceed. All right, thank you. Well, before we get started today so that we can hopefully make this round as enjoyable as possible and perhaps a little bit easier for you to judge, if each of you judges would be willing to tell us a little bit about yourself, perhaps what your past experience or background is, whether that be in work or in speech and debate, and if there's anything in particular you might want to see or maybe might not want to see in this debate round, that would be really helpful to both Caleb and I. And if we could start with uh, Ms. Fraser. Hi, first of all, congratulations on being in the NCFCA final round for Lincoln Douglas. Huge accomplishment. Uh, I am an alum and a coach. I uh, competed, my last year was 2012. I uh, competed in both policy and Lincoln Douglas debate, but really policy was my main event. I won policy nationals in 2012, uh, but I did go to nationals one year in LD, and I, for some reason, judge LD a lot. Uh, so I am looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, professionally, I am working on my doctorate in mass communication psychology at Ohio State, and I teach undergraduate classes uh, in communication, and I um, have a master's in public administration and undergrad degree in political science and communication. So all of this is very interesting to me and relevant to what I do. And uh, in terms of a grudging philosophy, I really want you to define the round for me. Um, my only big pet peeve is that I, I would say I actually have two for Lincoln Douglas. Um, one, I, I absolutely understand this is a different event than policy, but I think in any type of communication, you need to support your argument well. So giving me good warrant for um, your claims is helpful. And then second, that you represent the other speaker accurately uh, and do your best to accurately represent the arguments that they make in the round. But otherwise, I'm just really looking forward to hear what you have to say today. Thank you so much, Ms. Fraser. Uh, Mr. Hines? Sure. Uh, a little bit about my experience. I've done debate pretty much since I was 11, so I competed in the NCFCA for seven years. I mostly did TP, um, like Rebecca, but I have taught and judged and competed in LB a little bit throughout my time. Um, a lot of that came in college, so I moved to New York to attend King's College. I'm almost graduated. I have one more semester. 
uh, and I've done anything from policy, and then I spent a lot of time doing parliamentary, both in high school and in college. Um, since then, I have moved back to Texas. I'm doing some business things as well as coaching debate. Uh, in terms of a judging philosophy, uh, the main thing is I don't think debate's about finding a perfect case. So I would say it's mainly about presenting the comparative benefit of your side, even if we're talking about values in LD. So the better you can tell me what is valuable and how you best protect it, just that's the more likely I'm going to vote for you. So I won't make like non-obvious links for you as the debater. Uh, the more you explicitly show, just the more I have to work with and weighing at the end of the round. I look at my flow very heavily, so the more I've written down, the better that is for you. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Mr. Myers? Um, I am also a current undergraduate student. Um, I've done all sorts of different speech and debate throughout high school and in college. I do uh, moot court a lot. I have experience competing, judging, and organizing moot court tournaments. Um, and in terms of my judging philosophy, um, I'd say the number one thing is responding to each other in an accurate and detailed way. Um, you should respond to the best argument, and um, I should be able to tell that you've thought of these responses in the moment and not had them canned beforehand, necessarily. Thank you. And Dr. Summers? Yes, good morning. And once again, congratulations on making it into the final rounds. Um, I'm Janet Summers. I serve as the provost and chief academic officer at the University of Northwestern in St. Paul. My undergraduate degree is in English education, and uh, my, my doctorate is in um, literature. And I have had the privilege of working alongside NCFCA for a number of years now and have judged the final Lincoln um, Douglas debate one other time and speech session as, as well. And so I'm pleased to be here today and very eager to hear um, your arguments and how you engage with one another. I believe that it is going to be very important for you to, to support your arguments with compelling, engaging evidence. I always look for the structure and flow of the argument. Uh, I love the ar arguments that are logical and arguments that engage the, the mind, um, the heart, and the ethical um, uh, undergirding of who we are as individuals. I will also be looking at your engagement with one another and your ability to listen well and respond effectively. To, um, to your peer. So congratulations, so happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mrs. Hand. Good morning, gentlemen. I want to add my congratulations to you both for making it to finals at nationals. That's a big deal. So um, I want to suggest to you that you have arrived. Therefore, you should take a deep breath and have a good time because this is it, baby. And you know, there's no, you can't go up anymore. So um, have a good time because I think that when you enjoy yourselves and the sport of debate, your observers also enjoy it more. And you probably do better too. So have a great time. I know you're both tired. I know how that is. So um, give us all you got. Have a great time. And in terms of what I'm looking for in a debate round, I like the logical debate. If it's not on my flow, it didn't happen. Um, I do like to see, especially with this resolution, um, a little more support. I do respect your personal opinions and your personal logic, but um, I do like to see a little more than that in um, justification for points. And um, I suppose um, beyond that, um, I really have little else to say in terms of what I'm looking for. And I probably should say a little since my colleagues have about my background. Um, I'm an NCFCA parent. I have coached LD uh, regional and national champions in the past. I have been very privileged to do that. Um, I kind of know what you're doing, so I probably won't have a lot of trouble following you. But like I said, please be sure that you, um, you know, tell me what you want me to put on the flow, because if you don't, if it doesn't show up there, then it doesn't count. 
and um, my personal information. I also went to Ohio State University for graduate school. I studied classics there, Latin and ancient history in a, in a master's program. Um, before that, I graduated from Vanderbilt University with um, a degree in classical languages and um, medi basically medieval Renaissance history also. So um, then I went on to get another master's at Vanderbilt in corporate education. So I used to do corporate training and performance development and consulting and all that jazz before I retired to be a mom. So um, in the last 20 years, I have retired. I've been in retirement, as I like to say. My eldest son, Samuel, who once won the Black Mountain Tournament in LD, um, married his duo partner and colleague in debate at the end of May, Sally Hammer. So uh, NCFCA colleagues have again married, and I understand that was a big weekend because two others did too. So other than that, I wish you well. May, may the best man come out on top and have a great time, guys, okay? Thank you so much to all of our judges for sharing that about yourselves. <laughs> yes, thank you all. All right, well, if all of our judges are ready, and including Mrs. Hand, who's off camera, if you could give us a verbal confirmation. Yes, I will try to remember to do that throughout. I can hear and see. Go forth and be and be and be uh, your debater selves. Thank you. My timer is set for six minutes. And if Caleb, you're also ready. Great, well, then let's begin. Quote, secrecy is the keystone to all tyranny. Not force, but secrecy and censorship. When any government undertakes to say to its subjects, this you may not read, this you must not know, the end result is tyranny and oppression, no matter how holy the motives. Unquote American novelist Robert Heinlein. It is because secrecy leads to tyranny, and the right to know upholds liberty that I stand resolved in democratic elections the public's right to know ought to be valued above a candidate's right to privacy. According to Alan Weston, an expert on the right to privacy, the right to privacy is, quote, the claim of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves how, when, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others, unquote. Thus, the right to privacy means control over any kind of information about oneself. The right to know simply means a right to knowledge about candidates. It involves the right to publish investigations about candidates, even if those investigations might be damaging to the candidate's privacy. Now, the value or weighing mechanism that I propose is liberty. Liberty is something that is vital and we must preserve and protect it. And liberty involves all of our basic freedoms and rights. Whichever side of the resolution today best upholds liberty should win this round. That brings us to contention one, the right to know upholds liberty. The right to know upholds liberty. So point A is that the right to know is a fundamental right. The right to know is a fundamental right. John Adams put it best when he said, quote, the people have a right, an indisputable, unalienable, indefeasible, divine right to that most dreaded and envied kind of knowledge. I mean of the character and conduct of their rulers, unquote. John Adams goes on to explain that because our leaders are our representatives and trustees, we have a basic right to know about whether they are qualified to represent us. Otherwise, we would have no way of ensuring that our rights are respected. We, the people, have a basic fundamental right to know about our leaders, and only by voting for the affirmative will this basic right be protected. But another right is at stake in this resolution, bringing us to subpoint B, the free press. Subpoint B, the free press. John Adams goes on in the same argument to write that the primary way we get this information about candidates is by the press. And this is just as true today as it was in the 1700s. This is why, under the First Amendment, we have a broad freedom of the press. Anyone can choose to investigate candidates or other public figures and publish that information without fear of being punished. The founders created this protection in order to preserve our right to know. But if we take the negative position today, if we say that candidates' privacy matters more, that means that we would have to in some way prevent the press from publishing damaging private information about candidates. And this would require censorship, which would clearly violate our liberty, especially our cherished freedom of the press and our right to know. It is vital that we continue to preserve the rights guaranteed to us by the First Amendment. And we'll look at just how important this is with my third and final subpoint under this contention, subpoint C, 
the resolution protects against tyranny. Sub point C, the resolution protects against tyranny. Patrick Henry once said, quote, the liberties of people never were nor ever will be secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them, unquote. In Patrick Henry's day, many wanted to keep candidates' records private. In fact, for centuries, it had been a crime throughout most of Europe to publish damaging information about political leaders. However, the founders saw this for what it really was, a path to tyranny. Remember that privacy simply means control over information about oneself. Imagine if Richard Nixon or any other modern politician or all, uh, ancient politician for that matter was the final decider whether information about them was published or not. That would be a frightening world. Politicians' privacy really ends up meaning secrecy. This is dangerous and is, is a threat to our liberty. Tyranny stems out of a government where the people cannot know what is going on in their own government. As Heinlein said, no matter how holy the motives are, I'm certain that Caleb has excellent motives today, censorship and secrecy will inevitably lead to tyranny. We must preserve our right to know about our leaders if our liberty is to be safeguarded. But what about the right to privacy? Well, let's turn to contention to candidates' right to privacy is limited. Contention to candidates' right to privacy is limited. Now, I would agree that privacy is good and an important right. However, politicians' privacy is significantly limited. In 1890, two famous lawyers, Warren and Brandeis, wrote a famous Harvard Law Review paper called The Right to Privacy. And in it, they argued for the importance of privacy for private citizens. This is the paper that is considered to have invented the very right to privacy itself. But they explicitly denied privacy for candidates or other public figures because we have a right to know about them. These are the preeminent experts on the right to privacy. And they agree that when it comes to our politicians, the right to know is more important than the right to privacy. The great privacy experts who followed them also agreed with this. The right to privacy and the right to know are both good and important. But when we're looking at the specific context of candidates in democratic elections, the right to know is more valuable than the right to privacy. The clear testimony from nearly all the greatest thinkers from the beginning of the age of democracy until now sides resoundingly with the affirmative. This wisdom tells us that when it comes to public figures, our right to know whether they will represent us well is far more important than their right to privacy. Although privacy is good for private persons, granting this expansive right to politicians will only ensure that the freedom of the press and the right to know will be trampled on and politicians will gain unchecked power leading to tyranny. The only way and the best way to uphold liberty is to side with the affirmative. Thank you, and I'm now ready for any questions that Caleb might have. All right. Thank you for that speech, and I have a clock here set for three minutes for cross-examination. So I'll make sure that all of our judges are ready. Ready. All right, awesome, and thank you, Mrs. Hall. And Josiah? I'm ready. All right, awesome, and we'll go ahead and begin. First of all, congratulations to make the finals. I, it's a huge accomplishment, and I'm really glad that you're here. I just have a couple of questions with about your last speech. Begin with the definitions debate in this case. So going on to the definition of the right to know, do you agree that you presented a no definition of the right to know? Is that correct? I would actually disagree with that. I did present a definition. I, it wasn't from a dictionary because it's really summarizing a lot of definitions that are, uh, have been published in especially the media ethics literature and the literature on the right to know. If you would like a definition from a source that really backs up this definition, I'd be happy to provide it. Sure, if you could bring that up in the next speech, that'd be great. Now, I believe you cited in reference to the right to know, you cited John Adams, is that correct? That is correct. That's one of the sources I reference. Okay. Now, he said specifically that the people have a right to the character and conduct of their politicians. Is that correct? Yes, that is one of the things he said. Okay. Now, can we agree that nowhere in this quote does it note that the right to know is, in fact, a fundamental right? Is that correct? Uh, no. He actually, well, he doesn't use the word fundamental. He instead uses the words indisputable, unalienable, indefeasible, and, and divine. Uh, so I believe that although he didn't use the word fundamental right, it would be appropriate to use fundamental right in this context. All right. Thank you. And turning to the right to privacy, I see we can agree that the right to privacy is control over your own information. Is that correct? Yes. It is control over information about you. All right. Thank you. Now, returning to your value of liberty, what would be, in your own words, what would you define liberty as? Liberty is the preservation of freedom and also various uh, rights, especially uh, the basic rights that belong to all persons. Okay, thank you. Now, can we agree that every debate must have clash? 
Yes, yeah, so we need to be talking about the conflict between the affirmative and the negative position today, which especially, which in general means, is the resolution true or is it not? In the specific context of this value resolution, we're talking about whether the right to know ought to be valued by the right to privacy or vice versa. All right, thank you. And turning once again to the definition, I believe, of the right to know, is your contention that the right to know only pertains to information that the free press is seeking or searching for in this case? Can you clarify what you mean by that? Sure. My question is essentially, what limits are there to the information of the free press or what information the public has a right to know? There are some limits on what the press can publish that are established by the courts. Not all personal information can be disclosed, but the general rule is that personal information is disclosed. Okay. Uh, or uh, can yeah. information is disclosed. Okay. Now, within those limits that you're talking about, where exactly in our definition of the right to know or in John Adams' definition of the right to know do those limits or where are they specifically stated? So limits are not in the definition of the right to know itself. They're simply uh, what is in practice. Of course, in this debate, we're not talking about what's true 100% of the time. It's not that the right to know is always upheld above the right to privacy. It's that it's generally true. That's really how value resolutions work. There are some exceptions laid out for privacy by the courts, but those are limited exceptions. All right, thank you. No further questions. Thank you. I have my timing here set for three minutes for negative prep time. And I'll go ahead and start that now. All right, I've paused my prep time at a minute and 30 seconds remaining. I'll write that down really quickly. All right, and this will be a seven minute speech. All right, if all your floor judges are ready. Ready. Right, awesome, and thank you, Mrs. Hall and Josiah. All right, awesome, then we'll go ahead and begin. According to an article written by Ashoka University in 2018, it reads, quote, are we to understand that fundamental rights are status driven and that citizens who are running for public office automatically lose their fundamental right to privacy? The rationale for fundamental rights is that they are so sacrosanct that they cannot be sacrificed or abridged by the state. They may be subject to reasonable restrictions, but the restriction cannot eviscerate the very nature of the right, quote. It is because I believe that the protection of the right to privacy must take precedent in today's debate round and that it cannot be forcibly violated, especially without any pre-delineated restraints that is stand result against the resolution. That in democratic elections, the public's right to know ought not be valued above the candidate's right to privacy. Now let's take a look at the definitions really quickly. I agree with the definition of the right to privacy. It's the control of information. And branching off the control of information, as Josiah and I agree in cross-examination, in order for us to have a clash, we must have forced disclosure in this case, because let's consider it. In this case, we have these two conflicting rights, the public's right to access information and the candidate's right to control their information. Therefore, let's say, if a candidate voluntarily releases information to uphold the public's right to know, well, then there's no clash. Because the candidate still has control of the information. The clash comes down to when there is no control, when the candidate does not want to release information, but instead the public wants to because of the public will. Now, with that being said, let's turn to the definition of the right to know. And we can take this under a couple of points of resolutional analysis. 
You can check this as RA1, right to know is a civil right. Right to know is a civil right. Now we want to make a delineation or a distinction between natural and civil rights. Natural rights are where they have rights that are well natural in this case. The, the Declaration of Independence states life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is later clarified to be the right to property in this case. These are rights that we have by virtue of being human. We can use the desert, the, excuse me, the desert island analogy. If we're on a desert island, we also have rights to life, liberty, and property. But consider this. If we're on a desert island, totally isolated, what right do we have to the right to know? The answer is we have no right. The right to know is not a natural right. It's a civic right given to us by government in this case. So we must make a specific delineation between these two rights. With that being said, let's also turn to the actor for today's resolution. You can tag this as RA2, framing the resolution. RA2, framing the resolution. Now, I believe that Josiah is suggesting this idea of a press actor, that we're looking from the position of the press, and we're asking, does the public's right to know take precedent over the candidate's right to privacy? But I would contend that, that by no means falls under the purview of our debate round. My reasoning is simple. If we define the right to privacy as a control of information, and yet the public, or excuse me, the press in this case, already has control, and is using whether or not to release that information to the public, well, and then that's no longer falls under the right to privacy because the right to privacy is control. If the press has control, that no longer violates or upholds the right to privacy. The conflict in today's debate comes down to, in a general sense, when we ask ourselves the question, should the public's right to know, the public's right to access information, should the public be able to wrest away this information from the candidate? And I would argue that is not justified. Now let's turn on to the values clash, the framework in today's case. Now, Josiah argued the value of liberty in this case. And I completely agree that liberty is a great thing. But I would disagree with that it's a little too specific in the terms of today's debate, but also is in this case self-defeating. Because to uphold the quote unquote liberty of all citizens, we violate the liberty of the candidates themselves. So instead I posit the foundational rights in this case of democracy, which is capture value that of natural rights. Let's capture value natural rights. Number one, this is foundational to democracy and without it, a house cannot stand to quote Abraham Lincoln. Well also number two, the reason to prefer number two, that it provides a moral line, a moral line in this case. In essence, my argument is this, that the right to know ends where the candidate's right to privacy begins in this case. It provides a moral line, an objective standard to determine today's debate. Liberty in this case is as good, but natural rights encompasses liberty in this case and is fundamental to democracy. We must protect the, the rights and liberty of all citizens, not just those that are not violate the rights of those candidates. Like a Shukka University says, Fundamental rights are not status driven. Now, with that being said, let's turn to a couple of points of contention to clarify the negative side of this resolution. Beginning with contention one, unlimited equals unjustified. Contention one, unlimited equals unjustified. When we ask ourselves whether or not to vote for the affirmative side, we must ask some fundamental questions, which is number one, who determines what information is necessary for the conduct and character of politicians? But also number two, what exactly is this information? It's for example, if I'm a member of the voting public and I want to know whether or not my candidate is in a good marital status, as in his relationship with his wife or his, if it's a she, her relationship with her husband is stable, well, that can be determined or that can be important to the character and conduct of my politician. And yet when we think about it, what impact does that really have on whether or not that candidate can function well in office? Before we can vote for the affirmative side, we must understand the limits of the right to know. Every violation or limitation of any fundamental right, such as that of taxes or jury duty, has limits, is legally predetermined, and has boundaries in this case. The right to know has none of yet, per its definition, as Josiah and I agreed in cross-examination. I want to turn to one application to understand the implications of this, and that's application the French Revolution. Application the French Revolution. The French Revolution occurred in 1789 Essentially, one essentially like this: the peasantry, the French peasantry in this case, were remained under the heel of the French aristocracy, and so they rose up against this tyranny and fought against the aristocracy. This was a very, in this case, moral uprising, and yet it turned over too far because they valued the rights of the aristocracy to uphold and to fight against tyranny. In this case, now I'm not saying it's exactly the same as the right to know, but the reasoning is similar. To protect against tyranny, we overturn the fundamental rights of a single individual, or in this case, a single social strata. So the question is, what limits are there? Now, with that being said, let's turn to one last point of contention, which is contention to us versus them. Contention to us 
versus them. Consider the study done by the Local Elections America Project, which reads that, quote, there are nearly 90,000 local governments and more than half a million, half a million local elected officials in the United States. 96% of all elected officials are local officials. The affirmative has done a great job in saying that we need information to fight against tyranny. But consider this. We're not just talking about presidents or heads of state. We're also talking about your local HOA leader or your local city council member. The question for us today is, should information be wrested from them simply because the public wants them to? And I argue that we cannot violate their natural rights because everyone has an equal right of uh, the right to privacy. Thank you so much. I now stand ready for any questions that Josiah may have. Great. Well, this will be a three-minute cross-examination. If Caleb, you're ready, and all of our judges, ready. Thank you. And let's begin. Congratulations on being here in finals at nationals, Caleb. It's really an amazing achievement. Of course, I have a few questions for you. Hopefully, so we can have more clarity in this debate round. I'd first like to ask you: Like all other rights, the right to privacy can be limited in certain situations. Correct. Absolutely. If there is specific justification, then there are predetermined legal boundaries like that of the disclosure laws, in which candidates know about them beforehand right. and answer Thank them in you. order to run, then yes. Thank you so much. I would also like to ask you, when we have different rights in conflict with each other, let's say my right to swing your fist against your right to keep your nose intact, those different rights, one of them has to be limited in that situation, correct? Yes, we are talking about a clash in today's case. All right. I would like to ask you, is the right to speak a uh, natural right? The right to speak. The right to speak? Are you talking yeah. about free speech or the yes. right to verbally say whatever I want? Yes. Okay, I think in this case, it is protected under the Bill of Rights. However, I would argue that it's, it's essentially in this case, a subset of liberty. That's my right to act without restraint in this case. All right, thank you. I would also like to ask you, the freedom from tyranny is also a natural right as being tied to liberty directly, correct? The freedom from tyranny, I think in this case, I don't really know if we can define it as a natural right. I think we need to see some evidence presented before we can say whether or not it is a natural right or not. Interesting. All right, I would also like to ask you, all right, if we had, we're, today we're not debating about the extremes. We're debating about what's true most of the time. Is that correct? I agree that we're not debating the straw man. I'm not arguing that you're going to result in a tyrannical dictatorship. I'm not arguing for anarchy. But I'm simply asking for the bounds and limits of the public's okay. right to know. Okay, thank you. So just to be clear, uh, clarifying what I meant by that question, I'm not trying to accuse you of making a straw man. You're not. Um, the question what I was really trying to get at here is, we agree that we're not talking about whether the resolution is true 100% of the time or false 100% of the time. We're talking about whether it's true, let's say 51% of the time or false that amount of the time, if it's really true, generally speaking. Would that be fair? I would argue that in, in essence, yes, we're being asked to answer an ethical rule. All right. I would also like to ask you about, uh, you were talking about town councilmen. Can we agree that, especially in the United States, local levels of government generally handle most of the governance issues due to the principle of federalism? Due to the principle of federalism, I, according to my knowledge, and of course I'm still a high schooler, so I don't, I'm not an expert in this case, I don't really know if we operate under federalism that much anymore. I would agree that in terms of large scale governance, there is local officials in this case, but yes, in the large scale, in terms of, in this case, quantity, yes, local officials do govern most of the United States, but the overarching idea is that of the federal level. All right, thank you so much for answering those questions. That's all the time I have. And I'll be starting my three minutes of preparation time now.
Stopping preparation time with 59 seconds remaining on the clock. I'm just going to quickly write down that time. And this will be a four minute first affirmative rebuttal. If Caleb and all of our judges are ready. Ready. Thank you. Well, let's get started. Whichever side of the resolution you vote for today, someone's rights are going to be limited, if not violated. The only question is, whose? And today in the speech, I'll be helping you to answer that question and seeing how it actually is the rights of the candidate that must be limited in this situation. So let's begin today with the definition, the definition. Now, Caleb asked me to bring up a definition that uh, or a source that supports my definition of the right to know. There's actually several sources that I could cite. Since this is a four minute speech, I'll only be citing one. This is from the Journal of Mass Media Ethics. Quote, according to Goodwin in 1983, this doctrine, meaning the public's right to know, means that, quote, the public has a legal right to know what their government is doing, and the press is the representative of the public in finding that out, unquote. Now, Caleb seemed to disagree with the idea that it's the press and say, seemed to be arguing that it actually is government laws. I would like to point out that he actually didn't bring up a definition to support this claim, whereas the only definition we've had thus far in this round is from the affirmative, which shows that it actually is the press that's doing this disclosure. My opponent said that, well, that means that candidates' um, right to privacy is not limited in any way because the press has control of the information. That's exactly the point. If someone other than the candidate has control of the information, that means that the candidate's right to privacy has been limited because they no longer have control over their information, which is exactly what the right to privacy consists of. So this is really what we're looking about today in terms of the right to know. Since we agree to the definition of the right to privacy, we can now turn to the second point today, that of the value. Now, Caleb and I, uh, Caleb proposed the counter value of natural rights. I'll actually agree with this because it's essentially the same value as what I was proposing. Really, as I was understanding and explaining liberty, it is protection of natural rights. So whichever side you go with, these are really the same value. With that in mind, uh, we're now looking at which side, which person's natural rights, which person's liberties should be violated. Because again, one person or more than one person, one group will have to be limited at the end of the day. Point three is limits, limits. Now, Caleb said there's no limits in the definition of the right to know on the right to know. It's true, it's not in the definition. Most things aren't limited by their own definition, but there are circumstances in society that do limit the scope of the right to know. And again, I'm not arguing that the right to know is true 100, is more important than the right to privacy 100% of the time. There are exceptions for the right to privacy. There are some limits, but the fact of the matter is that most of the time, the right to know is more important. If this were a, an hour and a half policy round, I would love to delve into the details and propose a specific bill on where those limits are. But since this is a 45 minute value round, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that. Let's now turn to the fourth point. The right to know upholds liberty. The right to know upholds liberty. So point A is that it is a natural right. A natural right. Now Caleb said it's not a natural right because you don't have it in nature because you can't keep uh, you can't know about someone else if you're in nature. Well, you also can't keep information private from someone else if you're in nature. You see, both the right to privacy and the right to know are naturally occurring. That is, they you have a right to knowledge and a right to privacy no matter where you are. But the application of them in this resolution only applies in society because it's only in society that you can actually keep something secret from another person. And it's only in society that you can actually have knowledge about another person. So it is indeed a natural right. Let's turn to subpoint B, the press. Now, Caleb's main response to this argument was that, well, the press isn't the actor. It seems that he's arguing it's the government. But again, the definition of the right to know that we have in today's round says that it is the press. And thus, this argument still stands and shows that if we side with the negative, the freedom of the press will be trampled on. And again, free speech and the free press is a basic natural right. Subpoint C is tyranny. We must preserve our liberty. And if we have a tyrannical government, of course, we won't be preserving our liberty. Yes, we could have a slippery slope uh, and lead to the French Revolution potentially, but it's much more likely, as I explained in my case, that voting for the negative will be what causes tyranny. Local governments are powerful. And in fact, in France, the government is centrally controlled, which means that it's really the central government that most of the officials are. We need to look at all democracies, not just the United States. For all these reasons, I urge an affirmative ballot. Thank you. I have a timer here set for a minute and 30 seconds for remaining negative prep time. I'll go ahead and start that now.
All right, no prep time remaining. Every time here is set for six minutes for this last negative rebuttal. And if all of our judges are ready. Ready. All right, awesome. And Josiah? All right, awesome, then we'll go ahead and begin. Robert Snowden, the famous NSO whistleblower, once said, quote, nobody needs to justify why they need a right. The burden of justification falls on the one seeking to infringe upon the right. But even if they did, you can't give away the rights of others because they're not useful to you. More simply, the majority cannot put away the natural rights of the minority, end quote. Now, agree or disagree with Edward Snowden, as you may, this quote stands still in this specific instance, that we all have equal rights and equal access to these natural rights, that fundamental rights are not status-driven, but they're given to all of us because we are humans in this case. What I want to do is respond to a couple of Josiah's points through a couple of responses and finish up some voting issues, one of the most crucial reasons why the negative status resolution still stands. Beginning with the definition of the right to know. You can take this as response how versus why. Response how versus why. Now, if we go back to the definition that Josiah defined to support his side of the resolution, he defined it essentially as the idea of the public's right to access information, and that's carried by the idea of the press. And there's a couple of key words to understand in this definition, which is in the phrase that the definition that involves legal right. And so the subpoint A is that the right to know is a legal right. Subpoint A, the right to know is a legal right. But contrary to what Josiah has been arguing, his own definition of the right to know defines it as a legal right. And that's correct because this is a right that's only present in society, in civilization, as opposed to natural rights. Natural rights are rights that we have naturally, that we all have rights of life, liberty, and property in this case. So we can see the conflicting sides in this area. But the second thing we can see here is the idea of subpoint B out of how. Subpoint B out of how. Now, Josiah's argument in this case is he's arguing for the position of a press actor, in which the press is the one releasing this information. And yet he misses my entire, entire argument completely which is that the press has control of this information and no longer falls under the right to privacy. What do I mean by this? If we define the right to privacy as the right to control your own information, if the press already has access to it, that means that the candidate no longer has control and therefore does not fall under our purview. The definition or the clash in today's debate comes down to when the public wants to know information, can they take it away from the candidate? It doesn't matter how it carries out, the question is why. Which side of the resolution do we side with? Now, with that being said, let's turn quickly to the values clash. We can clearly agree with the values of natural rights, that of life, liberty, and property. But let's see, which side of the resolution does it uphold if we value natural rights in this case? And that's voting issue one, excuse me, voting issue one, the right to privacy is upheld by natural rights. Voting issue one, the right to privacy is upheld by natural rights. Now, let's consider this. Logically, if we value natural rights, we value the only natural right present in our current resolution, which is that of the right to privacy, it's a right that we have naturally, a subset of liberty and property in today's case. But furthermore, I think the argument that Josiah is trying to get to is protecting the natural rights of all of our citizens in this case. By preventing tyranny and stopping tyranny, we protect every citizen's natural rights. Yet again, we can see a couple of problems with this. First of all, fundamental rights are not status driven. In this case, the ends don't justify the means. I completely agree with, with Josiah's ends. I don't want a tyrannical government. I want to know information of whom we elect. But just because I want to know that information does not justify it as us taking away that information from a candidate, even when they don't want to. And here's where we see the parallels with the French Revolution. Again, I'm not arguing that Josiah is a supporter of the French Revolution, nor that I'm saying that we're going to see a 1984 a tyrannical government in this case. But the clarification here and the similarities are clear. In this case, the French Revolution valued the protection of the natural rights of everyone in France. And in, in order to secure those rights, they violated the natural rights of a certain social strata, that of the aristocracy in this case. We can see there are no limits to the public's right to know. And this is response also into his idea of the idea of point of limits, that circumstances limit natural rights or limits the right to know. And this is voting issue two, that of unlimited equals unjustified. Voting issue two, unlimited equals unjustified. Before voting for Josiah in today's debate round, we have to ask ourselves two questions. First of all, what information are we talking about when we refer to the right to know? Now, he argues that the circumstances limits the right to know, that there are no limits within his definition. But again, looking at this debate is about these two sides, the right to know, the right to access information, and the right to privacy. Like Josiah himself contested in his last speech, we're talking about an ethical rule, that in the vast majority of scenarios, the public's right to know ought to be able to take away information from the candidate. 
And that includes the vast majority of information. And so we ask ourselves the question, is the vast majority of private information, such as diary entries, text messages, phone calls, emails, is that crucial to the character and conduct and should the people be allowed to take that away from a candidate just because they want to? And the answer is no. As we can see in the Patriot Act a couple of years prior, decades prior, this was wrong in this case. Because in order to secure the natural rights of everyone, we violated the right to privacy, caused clear uproar, and this was clearly immoral and unethical because the ends don't justify the means. And with that being said, I want to respond to a, a, one last point out of the idea of tyranny. And that's the idea of the second question under this voting issue, which is place yourselves in the candidate's shoes. Remember, candidates aren't actually government officials as of, as of yet. The private citizen is running for this position. And furthermore, we're talking about the vast of local governments. Now, arguably, yes, local governments do have power, but that's not the point here. The point is that these are people, not tyrants, not tyrants, excuse me, not prime ministers, not presidents, but people like you or I. These are positions that you or I to run to. And this is the question. When we consider these local officials, these local positions, we're not voting away their rights. We're voting away the rights of others simply because we see the ends and we don't care about the means. And so in our opinion in this case, because the ends don't justify the means, because fundamental rights are not determined by your social status, and they stand resolved against the resolution. Thank you all so much for your time today. I'll be taking my remaining 59 seconds of prep time starting now. That is all of my preparation time. And this will be a three minute second affirmative rebuttal. If all of our judges, including Mrs. Hand, are ready. Ready. Excellent, and Caleb? Great, well, let's begin. Today, whichever side you vote for, someone's rights, unfortunately, do have to be limited. It's difficult to say that, and it's a troubling thing when we must do this thing. But in this situation, we don't have a choice. Whichever side you vote for, there will be a person's rights limited. The question is whose? And today in this last speech, again, I would like to help you try and answer that question. Let's begin with the first point, definitions and the value. Definitions and the value. The only I just like to point out that the only definition that's been proposed in today's round was proposed by the affirmative. And that makes clear that we're talking about the freedom of the press. We're talking about press as the actor, as the surrogate of the people in finding out that information. Now, Caleb said, well, that's only through laws. Uh, actually, the legal right that we're referring to in this definition is actually the First Amendment's protection of free press. That's how the government actually is preserving this right to know is through protecting the freedom of the press. So this argument still does stand under the affirmative team's definition, which is really the only definition we have to look at today. Also, we agree on the value. So with that in mind, let's turn now to the second point, that of limits. Limits. Now, Caleb mentioned the Patriot Act in his last speech. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm not arguing for the Patriot Act. This is nowhere near similar to the Patriot Act. Oh, that's not what we're talking about today. But turning to the issue of limits, my opponent said, well, the right to know is limitless. As I brought up in my last speech, I'm not arguing for a limitless right to know that applies 100% of the time. I'm simply arguing, arguing that the general rule is that the right to know should be upheld. And that's really what the affirmative team's position is today. And it's not that we need to uh, have no, a limitless right to know. Now, as I explained in my last speech, I would love to give dive into where all those limits and delineations are. But of course, we don't have time in this short 45 minute round. So really what we're debating about today is what is the general rule? And the answer to that is the right to know. It's not limitless, but it is the general rule. So I'm turn now to the third and final point of today's round, the right to know upholds liberty. The right to know upholds liberty. So point A is that the right to know is a natural right. The right to know is a natural right. Both the right to know and the right to privacy, as I explained in my previous speeches, are indeed natural rights. They exist in nature and are applied in society. 
the, so right now, the scale of natural liberty, the scale that you're using in this debate round is balanced. How do you make your decision? Well, I'm glad you asked or didn't ask, I asked it for you, but that's what we'll be turning to now with sub point B as we look at other rights. Sub point B, the press, the press. Again, as explained in my first point today in this speech, the press is the actor in today's resolution. And as I explained in my very first speech in this round, if you side with the negative, the freedom of the press will be trampled on, which means that another critical liberty that belongs to the people and to the press will be trampled on if you side with the negative. So we have two rights already on the side of the affirmative, the right to know, and the freedom of the press, with only one natural right on the side of the negative, that of the right to privacy. Now let's turn to some point C, tyranny which again means we're preserving liberty. We're preserving the basic liberty of the people by protecting against tyranny. The logic in my affirmative constructive, it shows why if we sign with the negative, we will indeed have tyranny. Local governments and federal governments are powerful and we must have a check against them. For all these reasons, I ask for an affirmative ballot. Thank you. Fantastic job, Caleb, and congratulations once again on making it to uh, finals at nationals. And thank you all to all of our judges for judging. Thank you, gentlemen. It was it was awesome. Yes, great job, Josiah. And thank you, Mrs. Fraser, Mr. Hines, Mr. Meyer, Mrs. Summer, or excuse me, Dr. Summers, and Mrs. Hall. We really appreciate your time today. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.